So for those who haven't seen it, there's a timer counting down on here, 17, 16, 15. So it's an amazing system. They've got the start and end times of all of the talks. So it tells me when to start and it tells me when I need to stop by. Just in case you wonder why I'm standing here smiling at you all. So. OK, so welcome, everybody. Thank you so many of you for coming. Welcome to my talk on quickly testing legacy code. I'd like to start by getting a sense of how many of you in the room have at some point or other dealt with code that you feel was legacy code for whatever reason. That's fantastic. Virtually everybody. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I've learned a lot about working with legacy code over the last couple of years, and it's a, a real honor to be able to, to share it. And hopefully, I'm, I'm pretty confident you'll be able to take some useful techniques away that uh, you should be able to apply yourselves. Just a quick note about this QR code at the corner of the image that appears again right at the very end. And that links to a page that in turn has links to all of my talks, links to the sample code and the video I'll link to and I'll upload just the final slides later today. And so all those links will be there. And uh, so if you didn't get it now, it appears again at the end. So I'm Claire McRae. I have been programming for a living for over 30 years, which I find quite scary. 20 of those have been fantastically enjoyable in C++ and Qt or Qt, however you're used to pronouncing it. So I feel that qualifies me to talk about working with legacy code. Um, I wrote our original, of our original C++ code and maintained it over the years uh, with a lot of colleagues as well. At this point, I was working for an organization called CCDC in Cambridge in England. And CCDC is a nonprofit organization that exists to maintain a database of crystal structures. I'll explain a little bit more as I go through the next few slides, but they recently reached a million experimental crystal structures. So it's a fantastic resource for um, uh, scientific research, for teaching, for designing new medicines and things like that. Um, so at the back of last year, beginning of this year, I returned to C++ programming after a short break in management. And the requirements I had was to take a QT desktop application that displayed molecules in crystal structures. And since it had been created in 1999, it only knew how to draw atoms as spheres. But many of our users wanted some of the atoms to be displayed as polyhedra instead. So that involved some maths, it involved some OpenGL, and it involved making sure I didn't break the existing code. A little bit of context in case it helps. By crystals, I'm talking about the um, solids with regular repeating faces, of which sugar is a, a lovely example. The molecule inside sugar is sucrose. If you did chemistry at school, you might recognize these flat pictures, and undoubtedly you saw them in black and white, most of you, I'm sure. Um, these days, there are, for many years, there have been conventions in chemistry software to uh, color code atoms in particular elements um, by color so that chemists can glance and see patterns. So oxygen, as an example, is red, and I think the association of that was fire. Um, that was a planar image, but in practice, virtually all molecules have 3D shapes. And in fact, that's the value of the database is the three-dimensional information inside it. And in practice, the crystals, that your sugar crystals or whatever, are virtually infinitely repeating. Many, many, many uh, molecules in um, patterns um, that form together with these regular faces. So that's the domain I was working in. That's what I could do. That's what I needed to do um, on my own as a team of one. And the challenge I was faced with was how could I implement this safely? And the goal of my talk is to talk you through the techniques I used, what I learned. And even though I'm sure for most of you, your domain will be very different from this, I hope I'll be able to give you enough information to start to see um, where to look to start applying it for yourself in your own legacy code and the benefits that you can get with it and the options it gives you. So now going back a bit further in time to November two years ago, 
I, as I mentioned, I was actually not really programming in work at this point. I was dabbling in C++ in my spare time. My identity as a programmer meant I couldn't quite tear myself away. And then one of my programming heroes, Llewellyn Falco, asked for help with adding Google test support to this thing, approval test, which I didn't really know what it was. Um, but I kind of tentatively stuck my head up and said, tell me more. And he jumped on the opportunity. We had a conference call and started working together. And now, nearly two years later, what I'm talking about is what I've learned from that experience. And, um, but I do want to say that the pairing was an amazing experience as well. I'd paired at work, but I'd never done remote pairing as well. So with screen sharing and a separate screen, we used iPads and FaceTime so that you've got separate screens for sharing the screen and sharing the face-to-face um, -face video. It actually turned out to be really, really effective. I'm talking about a few hours a month on average or something like that. So as I've hinted, my goal is to share what I've learned um, to enable people here and watchers of the video to find easier ways of testing in challenging scenarios. I want to talk briefly about what I mean by legacy code, though actually the definition really doesn't matter. The bottom three, I think, will be familiar to, familiar to many of you here. Code without unit tests, profitable code that we feel afraid to change, or if, like me, you work for a non-profit, Kate's code you want to change but are afraid to. I've recently saw in a fantastic podcast, Legacy Code Rocks, I recently heard them talking about other definitions and they pointed out in almost every other sphere, legacy is something of value, it's something you inherit, something of emotional or financial value that you inherit or you pass on. That's a nice thing. Um, can we try and reclaim legacy in software to not be this awful, stressful, stressful thing? And, and I believe so. So given the number of you that said yes to having worked in legacy code, I imagine that you're really familiar with this cycle. The idea that you need to change some code, but it doesn't have tests, and therefore probably it wasn't designed to be tested. And so you need to refactor it in order to add tests, but you can't refactor it until it has tests. So that's the cycle that we want to break out of. And in this talk, I'm going to focus on the right-hand side of that. So the scenario where you don't have tests or your tests are not good enough and it wasn't designed for testing. So what can you do? How can you break out of that loop? And when you can break out of one part of the loop, the rest gets easier. I'm going to make some assumptions for, in the interest of time, um, I'm going to assume that so you understand that automated testing has some value. I am going to assume that if you have existing tests that you're going to be able to evaluate them. Because if they're good enough, then you don't need this, the rest of this talk for this example. That might be using code coverage tools, or it might be doing mutation testing, sabotaging the code. And I'm going to ask you to suspend any concerns about, oh, it's not a unit test, or it's only an integration test or a regression test. The point here is to take any reasonable means to safely modify your code to get you started in making those other more granular tests. Uh, so by way of in introducing testing of legacy code, a key phrase that people who work a lot in this area use is locking down the current behavior. So um, capturing the current behavior in a way that we can repeat it and detect whether the behavior changes in future. As I've alluded to, it can be really time consuming writing unit tests, small chunks of tests for legacy code. A big challenge is you may not even understand what the intended behavior is. You may write a test that casts in stone something which turns out to be unused and people can't delete it because it's got a test. So much of it must have mattered or actually it was buggy, but you got away with it because of some other part of the system, but you've written a test so people assume that was the right behavior. So there's another way called golden master testing. And with golden master testing, what you do is you take in the middle your existing code and you try and make the smallest possible changes to be able to call some 
core bit of the system, bits that you can't break down. You try and find some seam, or maybe you're lucky and it's a console application you're testing and you don't have to change it at all. You pass some input in and save some output. Maybe you have to modify the code. Um, uh, this screen is flashing. I don't know if it's possible to do anything about it. Okay, I'll go back to looking at my, my screen. Um, so assuming that you know that you can pull together some input set of data, a particular test case, and feed that into your program, and then you capture some output, some, some representation of your program. That becomes your golden master. So I'm making the assumption that you don't know what the right answer is, and you just want to capture the current behavior. So you preserve these, those three things, and then over time, perhaps repeatedly in a build system, and certainly on developer machines, you keep rerunning it. And when you're in the scenario that you aren't changing the behavior, you're refactoring and you want to make sure you haven't accidentally changed the code, then as you repeatedly run these golden master tests, if the output is the same, then you declare your test passed. And if the output is different, then you say, OK, I unintentionally broke the code. So some thoughts on that. It's a great way to start testing legacy systems. I imagine, and I saw a few nods earlier when I even mentioned it, I'm sure I'm not alone in having written a sort of homegrown version of this and thought, woohoo, I've invented something new, and, and then it gets fragile over time and it's hard to maintain. It's fine when the, the goal is to keep the existing behavior unchanged, but it has all sorts of usability issues. It's really easy to accidentally overwrite the golden master and then you never detect a, a failing test. And it uh, can be hard to get stable output. It can be quite hard to capture meaningful output. So Golden, the rest of this talk is built on a really powerful implementation of Golden Master Test. So that's the, the foundation. Uh, but if you want to use that sort of approach more quickly, then we move on to approval tests. I mentioned Llewellyn Falco earlier. More than 10 years ago, he created this idea and named this idea of approval tests. And it's, it's a really sophisticated, powerful, amazing implementation of Golden Master. It was already written to support a wide variety of languages with consistent vocabulary across all of the implementations. I think that's a real part of the power of it. So if you're working in multiple different systems, you can use this in multiple different languages or environments. Um, you can take advantage of it. And now, of course, there's a C++ implementation. In GitHub, it's called ApprovalTest.cpp, but this has confused some people. It sounds like it's the name of a source file, but it's named like that to be consistent with the Python implementation and so on. So if it helps, then maybe think of it as approval tests for C++. It works on Windows, Linux, and Mac. And I'll have one or two examples where I show it working on greenfield systems rather than legacy code. It's header only, and it's got a very permissive license. It works on C++ 11 and above. Uh, it works with a range of testing frameworks. And later on, I'll explain a bit about the interaction between approval tests and testing frameworks, because that has sometimes caused a bit of confusion. But for now, it supports the Google test framework, Catch, one and two, um, though with C++11, there's only really any point using catch two. And most recently, doc test, which is similar to catch, but builds and runs a lot faster. So I'm going to tell you how to get hold of approval tests. Um, the link, uh, oh, so the first thing to say is that if people want to just experiment with it, then we have uh, something called a starter project. And the idea is it's a minimal chunk of code that you can download it and open it in any development environment that supports CMake. Or uh, it's got a Visual Studio 2017 um, solution file in it as well. So you can open that in um, that version of Visual Studio, or presumably any newer version will automatically update the files. So if you want to just experiment with, with it, you don't need to. Um, fork or clone the repository, you can just use um, GitHub's uh, download the zip feature and just expand it and start experimenting. 
Alternatively, you can download the single header file yourself. And there's a nice, great, big, obvious link just under things like our builds are passing. And we've adopted the contributor, contributor covenant on the right-hand side. Just a, a couple of words about that. If you download via that route, you'll find there's the latest version number in the file name. And I don't recommend that you hash include a file with a version number in all of your test files. I, I, I'm sure that's, that's obvious to everybody, but it it's, will cause a maintainability headache over time if you've, every time you update the approval test library. So you can either rename the file to your uh, naming convention of your choice, or you can create a, a one-line sort of wrapper header file that says hash include the file name with the version number, whichever you prefer. I'm going now to talk through some code examples to, to give you a very simple beginning to end work through. I'm going to do this with catch. As you'll see later on, the code is virtually identical between catch and doc test and the Google test framework. So there's no point talking you through, through three different examples. So I've just picked one. So the first thing you need to do is you need a main and you need to make sure that your main uh, compiles in the code that is needed for approval tests to understand what test framework you're using and how that test framework uh, names its, its tests and names its source files. So in your traditionally main.cpp, you just need these two lines, hash define approvals underscore catch and hash includes whatever you called the approval test header that you downloaded. That is a relatively slow file to compile. That's going to be compiling a lot of code. So then you would put your tests in a different file in practice. So here we have a, some test file. And this, for those who haven't seen catch2, this is a catch2 only test. So I'm including the catch header. And catch says test underscore case, and you give a name, a descriptive name for your test. And require is how catch spells assert. If we now wanted to do the same thing, but with an approval test uh, inside catch, we add the approval test header, and everything else is the same, but instead of the require, the approvals vocabulary is verify. So we're saying approvals, colon, colon, verify, some nonsense fixed string for the sake of a demo. In practice, this would be the result of some function you've called some object that you're testing. I just want to highlight that my test case is called test fixed input, and my test file is called test02 for the sake of example code. So when I run this, the first thing that happens is that my test fails. And this is an important thing to explain with approval tests. They always fail the first time that you run them because you haven't told them what the approved answer is. So they have no way of knowing. So this fails saying approval file not found. And then it pops up a differencing tool, Araxis Merge. And that's zoomed in on that view. Now, before I explain what's in the differencing tool, I want to explain the vocabulary at the top, because this is just something to get used to. If you've used um, most other test frameworks, you might be used to the test code says what the expected answer is. And you provide it with your actual answer. That's the normal vocabulary. Approval tests uses approved instead of in, um, expected. And it uses received instead of actual. Um, that's just the way it is. And it wouldn't be a good idea to change it, because it, we want it to be consistent with the implementations in all of the other languages. So moving on, what I hope you can see in the, at the, the bottom red rectangle near the bottom of the screen, Araxis Merge is saying there's one change. There's one difference between the left and the right. And a bit higher up, we can see that on the left hand side left hand side the file is called test02 remember that was my source file name dot test fixed input which was my test case name dot received dot txt and on the right is the same thing but dot approved dot txt so you don't have to supply the file names approval test does it automatically by understanding the test framework that you're using now 
uh, in an ideal world, I would have a mouse to demo this, but it's not working with the projection system. So um, imagine that I'm clicking on the little button just above the green arrow, and that is how in Araxis Merge, you copy your text from one side to the other. So what I'm going through now is I'm showing you how I tell approvals that I'm happy with this output. So I've copied the text from left to right, and Araxis Merge says the files are identical, and then I click by the green arrow, I click on the Save button, and then I click by the cross, and I close Araxis Merge. Now, that is, that is the, the standard conventional way in approval tests that you approve the file. But you can script it, you can copy it by hand. The approvals provide lots of different ways to do that. But in terms of explaining the basic concept and the basic steps, I thought it was worth talking you through that. And the next time I run the test, I haven't changed the code, so the test passes. And then approvals test doesn't show a difference in tool because there's nothing to show us. So the test runs so run silently until the code changes in some way, or, this, or there's a change on the system it's tested on if that affects the behavior of the code. So it is, I hope that's given you a sense that it's a very convenient form of golden master testing. You don't have to worry about naming. You can control whether to overwrite the master or not without having to change your source code to do that. And it captures a snapshot of the current behavior. I said I'd talk about the difference between approval tests and your test framework. And I recommend that you think of approval tests as an addition to your existing test framework. It doesn't replace it. If the test that you're writing, the code that you're testing, pr produces some small result that you can write, require, or expect, your test is going to be faster and simpler and easier for you or someone else to maintain. There's no need to introduce file handling to it. But if you're testing larger, more complicated things, where it would be very onerous to write out lots and lots of different require or assert statements, then that's where approval tests shines. So in, if you look at our test, you'll find in many cases, we've got a mixture of a quick um, require or assert followed by um, a, a larger approvals verify. I'm not going to talk through this slide, but on the left-hand side is the catch code that I've just talked through, and you'll see just the minimal differences for doc test and Google test. So that's there if you want to refer back to it later. With what I've shown you, as I write more tests, uh, my test suite directory fills up with lots of approved files. And that is fine, absolutely not a problem. But if you don't like that, if you think it becomes cluttered, you can add um, this line to your main, um, call approvals, use approvals subdirectory, and hold on to what it returns. And then instead of your files being written out in that layout, they'll be written out in that layout. So all of the approval files will be hidden away in a subdirectory. And in fact, that approval underscore test is the default name. If you call that use subdirectory function and don't supply a parameter a value, it will put them in approval test anyway. So I just want to pause for a moment here because what I've just covered is really core to understanding the rest of the talk. So I know that there'll be some, but what if questions about different scenarios and things like that. And so don't worry, I'll cover those later. But um, if there's anything that wasn't clear in what I've said so far or about how it works, um, I appreciate any questions now to give me a chance to clarify it. So just to clarify, uh, you're running your thing on your own. Mm -hmm. And then you're running this to make sure that the output file that it produced is what you wanted. So you're going off to, to a terminal someplace and setting up and running your your beast and then you're running this on the result or this somehow you rigged it to run your thing for you so the question was am i running some existing beast, some existing software capturing the output and then running the tests or are the are the tests generating the output in the first place have i understood that correctly yeah 
you're, you, you're running your system independently, however you run it, and then this is what checks your output. Okay, so that tells me I didn't actually explain it entirely correctly, so thank you ever so much for asking that. So still, as, as with Golden Master, you do still need to find a seam within your program to find a way to call your system, your body of code that you're testing to be able to invoke that from within the test framework and for it to be able to write out something that you can compare. So thank you very much for that. Hi. Uh, I noticed that the, uh, those are the golden masters, right? The mm. text files. Uh, they are sitting beside the source code for the tests. That's Are you reading those at runtime or to pipeline? Or? So the question was about once the text files are generated, what happens to them and how they're used. Is mm -hmm. that a yes. good summary? So yes, the when approvals test runs, it saves the received file and it looks for the approved file of the same name and it reads the contents of both of those files in and compares them. So I probably wasn't explicit enough to say it's really important that you check into your version control system the approved files along with the test suite files. The two absolutely go hand in hand and if you don't check in the approved files uh, you'll get test you, you or your colleagues will get test suite failures. I'll just take one more and then move on. <coughs> So the question was whether if you've got both catch or Google test or whatever tests and um, approval tests, whether to keep them in a separate library um, or to keep them together. My recommendation would be to keep them together. That you want, if someone is changing an area of code, they want to be able to run all of the tests that are fast enough. If you want to see more about that though, the catch tests itself themselves use approval tests, the Python version of approval tests, and they have some tags in square brackets that they associate so they can say, this is an approval test, this is not an approval test, and then they can run them separately or they can run them together. Um, so, okay, so I will, I will move on. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say now that's coming up when I originally gave versions of this talk, I talked in quite a lot of detail about some small things because we didn't have any documentation. But in the last few months, we've put quite an effort into writing user-focused documentation, so thinking about scenarios. And it's been a really interesting experience. It turns out to be, rather than thinking, what do I need to say about this functionality, saying what would somebody need to understand in order to use this functionality, it's, it's harder, it takes more time, but you learn more about your code in doing it, and I'm sure that users get a better experience. So this QR code goes to what we call our user guide, and here's the table of contents, just to give you a sense of um, the kinds of topics that we're covering. It's not complete, it will grow, um, and, and in some of the later slides, I point to particular pages here, so that if someone looks at this over time and we've improved the mechanism or added new functionality, the, the important thing I want to focus here is what the possibilities, what the capabilities are. But to help you use that documentation, anytime you see some sample code on our GitHub page, you'll see it nicely C++ syntax highlighted and with these two links at the bottom, and I'm going to talk about the snippet source link. So if you click on that, you'll get taken to a page which the yellow highlighting does show up on the screen. It shows the exact lines in the source code where um, the code snippet was copied from. 
And the nice thing about that, it gives us and you confidence that the documentation you see is currently up to date and it compiles and runs because a lot of it, virtually all of it is extracted from our tests. A little bit is actually extracted from production code, um, like the lists of differencing tools that we support. If you want to know more about the mechanics of how we do that, um, it works for any uh, a range of um, um, uh, version control systems that have a markdown user interface for documentation. I've got a short talk on that in the lightning talks on Wednesday evening. L one little bit more, line 21 says, you'll see it's got the namespace approval tests. We recently put all of our code inside an approval test namespace, which of course clutters up the code no end. If you don't need that namespace, I really recommend that you add using namespace approval tests to your tests and don't bother stating the namespace. And all of the later examples will, of course, do that. So we, we touched on this just now, but that's great in theory, but how does it really help with legacy code? There's a long way between some fixed string and any kind of concept of, a, of real world use of this. So this is my attempt at representing how you might bundle up your legacy code to use this, with the caveat that I don't know anything about your legacy code, so allow me some leeway. So the, it, it really took me a while um, to, to understand the simplicity of what Llewellyn was talking about in this advice. Um, but he very strongly recommends that any time you use approvals for any um, custom type, that you bundle up the creation of the thing that you're going to approve, the thing you're going to represent on disk in a one line function or method or whatever. And so here I've got my nonsense, do legacy operation. Now, in the real world, you'd probably pass in parameters to this so that you could test lots of different inputs, just a simple example. And so I've made that return a legacy thing. Now, that might be an existing object, an existing class in your code, or it might be something new that you've created purely for the convenience of using approval tests. That's for you to decide. And then in this example, legacy thing is something that can be represented as characters, as a string. And so we can simply pass it into approvals verify, much like the fixed string that I had earlier. And if you look at the middle block of code here, that works in this case because we've provided an output stream operator that takes a std o stream and a, a legacy thing, and we write out whatever text we want to represent it as. I've got a slide later on that talks about, so, so there are lots of issues with doing it this way in terms of maintainability if you're approving large objects. So this is the simplest possible way of doing it. And later on, I touch on some alternatives, but just to try and give you a conceptual starting point. So this gives you consistency of naming over machines, over different developer machines and CI builds. It does mean, though, there's a pitfall here. If you ever move your source file, rename your source file, rename your test, your approved files are going to need to be renamed in your version control system as well. And it is easy to forget to do that then you get failing tests. And you want to try and use it with git, move, or whatever to maintain the version control history, that it was a move operation rather than a creation of a new file, if you possibly can. Um, it also provides consistency over operating systems. It's very opinionated that two text files are the same, even if the line endings differ. So one is a Windows file and one's a Unix file. Um, you can do something different if you want, but its opinion is so many people have version control systems set up where it's not guaranteed that you get the same line endings on every system. It wants to do the default friendly thing. It's consistent across languages. I'm showing you the C++ example, but the .NET and the Python are much the same and the vocabulary and the concepts are the same. To scale it up a little bit, it's quick to write tests. I showed you writing a single string. If you have a container of objects, you can pass that to approvals, verify all. 
And as with Verify, there are multiple overloads of this. Here, I'm using a version that allows me to use a Lambda. Uh, so my Lambda on the bottom line is saying, I'm going to write out the input value, V. So for each of the four values in my container, what's written out is V, and then the equals arrow, and then V squared. So the idea here is that in your approved file, you're helping your future self or your future colleagues, your future maintainers, by not just writing out the output, but writing out enough information so that if in future there's a test failure, someone can understand what the inputs were and help them deduce what the nature of the problem was. Maybe it only goes wrong for prime numbers or even numbers or something like that. So it's worth the effort to think about how you're structuring the information to make it easy to interpret test failures. Scaling that up if you had two containers. So think about you've got some legacy function, some function that doesn't have tests, and it has, say, six parameters, six arguments that you want to pass in. And it's got hundreds of lines of code inside, if this value, else if that value, and you want to test as many paths through the program as possible. And um, so you have a container for each of values to test for each of the input parameters, each of the input arguments in your function. And in this case, I've got two trivial example. And what uh, verif uh, combination approvals verify all combinations does is a Cartesian product. It does for every value in the first container, then for every value in the second, for every value in the third. Currently, it goes up to nine. Um, we will extend that soon to remove the limit. I've had some lovely feedback on ways to do that. Um, so here we've got a, a lambda again. So um, it's a trivial example, but to try and give you the sense of the kind of things you can do. So it's concatenating the, a value from the strings and then a text representation of a value from the numbers container. So we pass in the strings and the numbers, and here we get, we've chosen to write out the input parameters in parentheses and then the output. So again, think about the formatting, think about the patterns to understand if you get a test failure. To expand on what I said earlier, how you format that text information is really important to the maintainability of your tests in at least two areas. One is to guard against future changes to the class that you're um, approving. So if someone, say, adds a new data member or renames a data member and the output stream operator output changes, that's going to break all your tests. So you want to guard against that, um, but also to help with readability as well. So there's a lot of effort has gone into this to string page. But to give you an example of a small snippet from that, here I've got an approval file which is testing a container of three rectangles. So it's got X, Y, and um, width and height. And I was really happy when I saw that. That's fine. I can understand that. Uh, but actually, you can take exactly the same information and format it in a different way so that the values, the things that may change, are lined up. And then when you get a test failure, it's so much more readable. So that to string page talks about the mechanics of different ways of writing out, and it gives advice on formatting for different scenarios. So don't just assume that a nice way to format one thing when written out is the best way to format it if you're writing out a large container of the same thing. It's the general point there. I'm going to talk quickly over some customizability aspects of approval tests now, and I want to ask you to take this slide at face value and not worry about the details. It's a conceptual explanation rather than a detailed description of the implementation. So the components under the hood, there's a, a naming class, a, a namer, and that says what the, how the approval, the approved and received files are going to be constructed from the test file name. So you can control the directories that it's written out to and things like that. There's a writer class, and all the examples I've shown you so far just use a string writer. So, um, but you can write things in different formats if you wish. There's then a comparator, which 
reads the received file and the approved file and decides if they're equivalent or not. And I've already told you that the default implementation ignores line endings. And then if the comparator says the files are equivalent, fine, the test passed. And the received file is deleted to leave your directory structure tidy. If, however, the comparator says the received and approved are different, then it makes sure that the test, the underlying test framework logs, logs a failure. And then it calls a reporter. And a reporter is a really, really important part of understanding how to make the most of approval tests. So you've seen a reporter in action already, that Araxis merge window that I showed. So the default behavior is if there's a difference, approval test looks for one of a range of 20 or so common um, differencing tools across Linux, Windows, and Mac, and we welcome suggestions to add more tools and it will pop up the first reporter that it finds. And in the majority of cases, that's great. But if I talk through a few ways that you can um, take advantage of reporters. So again, they only act on test failure and they give you control over how to inspect that failure and how to act on it. The way to change the so normally, you don't tell approval tests what reporter to use. It has some, some default that it calls. But you can tell it to use a different reporter. So here, I'm saying, I'm calling approvals, use as default reporter. And then I'm passing in, um, saying I'm on a Mac, and I want to use beyond compare, which is a really nice um, diff reporter for images. And. I'm sure that um, you all know this, but this is using a pattern called RAII. -I -I. So that's a C++ name for it. Um, approvals calls it disposable objects. And it returns an object which contains a description of what the previous state was. And then it, make, so it makes the change that you asked for, and then it returns an object which contains the previous state. So it allows you to say, for example, in my application, my test as a whole, I want to use beyond compare. But in this one test, actually, I'd rather see, rather see the output as an approval, as an Excel file, for example. So I'm going to call a reporter that converts my file to Excel so I can visualize charts in it or something like that. So by controlling the scope of the customizations, you have a lot of flexibility. Uh, so yeah, it gives really, really good control. We recently added the no discard um, <clears throat> specification. So if you happen to be building on C++ 17 or above, you'll get feedback if you forget to hold on to that object. Uh, so examples of um, custom reporters to use, you can say Windows or Axis Merge Reporter. Uh, if your differencing tool is installed in a non-standard location, you can use generic default reporter and pass in the path to the tool. Um, or you can, those there in all the previous examples I showed changing the default, but each of the overloads of verify, verify all and verify all combinations, you can also pass in a specific reporter to use for that particular test. So it's really flexible. If you run your tests on a continuous integration system, approval tests will detect that and it won't show a graphical differencing tool because there's nobody there to respond to it. It will still log a failure. Everything I've just been talking about is an uh, approach called convention over configuration, which I only became aware of in working on approval tests. Um, and basically, it means by default, you want people to have as few decisions as possible to make, but they can customize things later if they want. I think it's a, I mention it because I think it's a really nice general design approach that I have learned from using this. So I just wanted to uh, spread the word about it. I'm often asked, what if the golden master isn't stable? Say it's got dates and times or something like that. Um, and the output changes each time. Maybe it's got object addresses. The conventional wisdom is, either you introduce an abstraction and change your code to pass in something which uses a fake date and time for tests, well, you, that's 
comes with a whole load of risk and work. Uh, maybe you write a custom comparison function. That's often hard. It still doesn't really help with approval tests because your received file will be different each time. So the insight here is to say, don't worry about changing what your code writes out. Make your test read back in the file that your legacy system wrote out and make whatever edits to the file you want. So if it's a date and time, have some regular expression that recognizes dates and times in your locale and convert it to some fixed string or something like that. So I think that's a lovely extra, whether you use appro approval tests or not, it's a lovely extra approach to get around instability of golden master output. If you wanted to do that, you would use the write method on the approval writer interface. A common question, a common challenge is if the legacy code that you're calling writes out more than one file. And our naming convention doesn't play nicely with that. You'd keep overwriting the, the same, the one file multiple times, multiple approved files. Just to show you that we recently wrote up a help page with lots of examples of scenarios, surprising examples actually of scenarios where that's relevant, like in cross-platform tests, and then different ways that you can handle it with different test frameworks. So if you have that situation, I recommend looking at that page. So I've, hopefully that's given you a sense of the power and the flexibility just from the reporters alone. So now I want to come back to the example I mentioned earlier. So remember I was writing out, I was converting um, an application that drew atoms as spheres to have the option to draw them as polyhedra instead. And so essentially what I'm doing is I'm approving images rather than text representations. And this isn't something that approval tests understands out of the box. So here I'm saying, don't worry about this magic six letter string. So I'm get some crystal structure out of the million compounds in the database and draw them, draw, uh, convert the atoms to the polyhedral display style, the appropriate atoms, and give me back a, a Q image. And that's QT's class for representing a, a color bitmap, a pix map. And then I have my one liner uh, that says verify Q image. And here, just to give you a sense of how you're going to encapsulate things, I've got my verify Q image, which I'm passing in my Q image. That should be passed in with a const reference, obviously. And um, I'll allow the caller to change the reporter if they want. So I'll make sure I always use the default reporter. And then I use a custom writer object, which I've called Q image writer, that writes out my Q image on, on request by approval test to a PNG file. And then I call approvals verify. Here's the writer I'm using and use whatever reporter I passed in or the default. So that's the encapsulation, how you would, the, the sort of components of code that you need to look at to change if you want to write things that either can't be written as text or humans can't easily interpret them as text. And just to spin through some examples, here I was making, so the top left is my received image Top right was the last one I had approved. And at the bottom, beyond compare shows the difference. And inside the red square, you might be able to see a few red dots. And those are pixels that are slightly different. I had speeded up my tests by reusing some widgets. And to my surprise, I didn't get identical images. So that told me something about the underlying code that I didn't know about, which was really valuable. With the previous images, I was remote desktopping in. So I was at home over Christmas writing my C++ on C talk and seeing if I could use approval tests for this. And I got back into work and then my beautiful test that had been running successfully started randomly just a small subset of my hundreds of images I was saving out started failing. And you won't be able, don't worry that you can't see the detail, I'm going to zoom in. But in the red box it says four pixels out of umpteen thousand are different. And if I zoom in, you probably still can't see the difference. And I keep zooming in, keep zooming in. And maybe finally you get to see the four pixels that are different. Um, you still can't see what the difference is. 
Um, down at the bottom left hand corner, which again I'll zoom into, there's extra information and it says on one particular pixel I'm hovering on, a red value is 42 on one side and 43 on the other out of 255, one to, 0 to 255. So in this particular case, no human is ever going to be able to tell the difference. And so I wrote a custom image comparison function with an approval test to say, if the difference is that small, ignore it, just say the test passes. And I think that's really important. So what testing of legacy code gives you is, first of all, the information when there is a difference. If you don't have a test, you don't see the difference. You still have to decide whether that difference matters or not. And maybe it's just too expensive to deal with and you hold your nose and say it's fine. Um, but you get fast feedback and you can make those kind of decisions quickly. So that was really, really valuable, the perspective I got. And we added multiple features to approval tests as a result. If you're interested in the differencing tools I used, there they are. They're both commercial tools, but they're both very, very good. And if you're diffing images, I, don't, I haven't found anything better than Beyond Compare. So in summary, if you're in the situation where you are adopting legacy code and you need to make a change, my message to you is you can do it. There are approaches. Um, there are these patterns for testing, followed by excellent resources on refactoring. Uh, so things which previously I just thought were completely intractable, these techniques are really effective, even for non-text types. So that's my, that's my take on how you can quickly test legacy C++ code with approval tests. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. I've um, just got a couple, one quick thing, and then, so if you want to know more, um, I'm, I'm going to the beverages with Backtrace thing over the next couple of hours. Feel free to come up and chat afterwards. I've also booked a slot at tool time tomorrow evening, and I'll have my laptop there. So if you're inclined and you want to come along and you know challenge me with some different scenarios or have a play with it and actually see it running in practice, you're very welcome. Um, here's the QR code I mentioned. I just want to point out, I really hope that what I've given you is a way to do this on your own and with your team and share the information. That was my intention. If you find that you want more information uh, or perhaps you want help with this or training or anything like this, I am now working as an independent consultant, having left my job of 30 mumble mumble years, because I've enjoyed learning about this so much and sharing it with other people. So ask us on Twitter if you want help, if it's a bigger thing, have a, have a chat about consulting. But I really hope that you'll be able to use it on your own. So with that, I'd like to repeat my thanks and throw it open to questions with the time that we've got remaining. So um, we have a page that says what you need to do, and it's very, only a very small number of features are required. Um, it took us about an hour to add doc test support, so it wouldn't be hard. If you would like to pair with one of us to implement it, we'd be really happy to just help you do that because it would benefit the community. So if you want to add a pull request, if, if you have time to help and pair, that's great. If not, please add the pull request anyway. Did I repeat the question? The question was, how hard is it to add support for boost test? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'll, I'll attempt to summarize that and tell me if I've got it right. So ideally, we would want to not use real databases, for example, or real files to provide input. We'd want to use mocking systems and things like that. And do we provide mechanisms for that? And the answer is that we see this as being used at the point when you are not yet able to rework your code to use mock objects. 
And so, no, we don't provide any mechanism for that. But what we want to do is enable you to get enough initial tests in place so that you're then confident to refactor the code to start using mocking or unit tests. I did have a slide which said, at the end of all of this, if you want, if you've got enough granularity, feel free to delete the approval tests and go back to um, more traditional tests, but there wasn't time for that. Um, hello. So thank you for noticing the microphone there. Yes, th there is one here. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is, I suspect I'm not the only person in this room who feels that the only problem with this talk is that we didn't hear it five years ago. Okay. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, and, and the architecture, for those of us who have been building golden uh, master tests uh, in these types of horrible systems. Um, I think it's very obvious that the architecture of this product is is great. It's and, and it it ticks all the boxes. So thank you. And I, my question is, uh, one of my frustrations as I've been dealing with this stuff is trying to penetrate the inconsistent jungle of terminology in QA. Um, uh, and this whole matter of developing automated tests, I mean, the, the terminological mess is really awful. And I, I suspect that one of the helpful things about using this product is it looks to me like some very good terminological decisions have been made. But uh, have you personally found any helpful resources or glossaries or something on, you know, what are the 40 different commonly used meanings of the word scrub, for example. <laughs> um, and, and just because, uh, again, it's for those of us who've dealt with this, there is no consensus, it seems. And it, it would be really helpful just to kind of figure out what are all the different things people mean. So I can show you a work in progress here. So if I... So this is our home page. I'm new to Max, and so please excuse me as I may not be quite as efficient. So I'll scroll down to the user guide. And then we do have a glossary page. The table of contents is pretty good. Unfortunately, a number of the sections are empty, but we will be fleshing that out over time. And so with scrubbers, for example, that's a concept that is not implemented yet in the C++ version, but we know what it's going to look like. So we provide a link to the approval test on net implementation in case anyone wants to do something equivalent for themselves. So um, I think the best I can say is, please, I'd encourage you to keep an eye on this page. And if you spot anything that's missing, do let us know and we'll enhance it. So thank you for the question. Well, thank you. OK. Um, next question at the microphone. Um, is there? Uh because going on my previous question, the files are together with the source. If you're doing a cross compilation, like for instance, uh, like I do for iOS or Android, uh, it would be hard for, for me to get the device to read those files. Yes. So is there any solutions for that or, or does so anyone thought about it <laughs> at the moment if i take a similar example of an embedded system where basically you, you it's hard to run standalone unit test code there at the moment approval tests makes the simplifying assumption that your algorithmic code your business co business code business logic code can be run and tested on a desktop machine and that then when that code is reused on your phone, um, your tablet, your embedded device, um, that it behaves the same and that the compiler, that you trust the compiler and it behaves the same. So sadly, the answer right now is no, we don't, we don't have um, an automated story for that. I don't know enough about, for example, the Android or iOS development tools to know if it would be possible to, to hook something together. If anyone found it was able to, it'd be great to be able to write up how to do it in our documentation. Thanks. I think we've got time for one more question. I'm lucky then. <clears throat> Thank you for the talk. Uh, I'd like, I just want to make sure that I got the gist of it correctly. Of so 
basically the workflow that you're proposing is take the existing legacy code base, treat it as a black box, have an input that you feed into it, save the output, and repeat this for as many output as, uh, input as you can, yes. save all the output, and then start changing the code and see if anything is different. Approximately. Okay. It, it, is there more to your question or shall no, I? No, I, I, I want to see if they, this covers, how much does it cover? Of, okay, uh, so in some rare situations, you would be able to use your legacy code unchanged. So if it was a console application that had input that you understand and output that you understand, then in that case, I would actually start with a Python implementation of approval tests and get Python to drive a range of different inputs. And knowing that their naming conventions are the same, you could save those outputs and then start reworking your C++ code to, um, to, to call the, the, the chunks directly. If you don't have that luxury, you, need, you do need to find a way to break into your C++ code to say, I want to call some chunk of stuff. And we can't take that away. Um, but what, what this allows you is to do that at a, a much bigger ball of stuff, a much bigger ball of code than you would need to separate down to for unit tests. Um, right. Does that clarify it? Yeah, yeah, I, I understood that. that. My question was mostly about, okay, you get all the possible outputs that you can get up front and after that you start changing. Yes, that's right. So you, as much as possible, you want to preserve in stone the current behavior so that when you're refactoring, you detect any unintended changes. As you add new functionality or fix bugs, it also gives you a way to review the changes and validate them. So it, it, it's useful after you start refactoring as well. But I was focusing on that initial stage in this talk. Okay. okay. Thank, you. Thank you again, everybody, for your attention. It's been very enjoyable. <laughs>